This is video podcast 14 from learningradiology.com, thoracolumbar spine trauma. I'm William Herring from Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. First, some key normal anatomy. Because of the fixed kyphosis of the thoracic spine, almost all thoracic spine fractures will be produced by hyperflexion. Most traumatic injuries to the thoracolumbar spine occur at the levels of T12, L1, and L2. There are limitations to the technique in conventional radiography of the thoracic spine. Both the upper and lower thoracic vertebrae are typically not visualized, the upper because of the shoulder girdle and the lower because of the soft tissue of the abdomen on routine views. So that may require special views such as a swimmer's view or a cone down lateral of the thoracolumbar region or CT. We're going to start at the top of the thoracic spine and work our way down. Simple compression fractures are hyperflexion injuries. They usually result in anterior loss of the height of the vertebral body of around 10%. There is no encroachment on the spinal cord and so there is no neurologic injury. And they are extremely common, especially secondary to osteoporosis. This is an example of a simple compression fracture of the thoracic spine you can see that the anterior aspect of the vertebral body is decreased in height relative to the posterior aspect. There's no evidence of retropulsion of any of the vertebral body fragments posteriorly into the spinal canal. Severe compression fractures are hyperflexion injuries. There is a greater loss of height, around 50%. There is usually retropulsion of fragments and a neurologic deficit is common. These are mechanically unstable fractures. This is an example of a severe compression fracture of the thoracic spine. You can see that there's a marked reduction in height of the anterior aspect of the vertebral body and that there is retropulsion of the posterior aspect of T9 into the spinal canal. You can also see that T8 is subluxed anteriorly on T9. The thoracolumbar junction is defined as T12, L1, and L2. Mechanically, it is different from the remainder of the thoracic spine because it's more flexible than the fixed kyphosis of the thoracic spine, and it is the portion of the thoracolumbar spine that is most injured in traumatic injuries. It sustains both hyperflexion and axial loading injuries, which usually occur with a jump from a height onto the feet. This is an example of compression fractures of T12 and L1. The black arrows are pointing to the depressed superior end plates of those two vertebral bodies associated with a comminuted fracture of the calcaneus in this individual who jumped from a second story burning building. Chance fractures, or seat belt fractures, were originally described secondary to hyperflexion from lap seat belts. With the advent of both lap and shoulder belts, chance fractures are now more often secondary to a fall in forced flexion. In a chance fracture, there is distraction of the posterior elements of the vertebral body, and there is impaction of the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. Chance fractures are horizontal fractures through the spinous process, the laminae, the pedicles, and the vertebral body. Sometimes the fracture through the vertebral body may be difficult to see. They are particularly important because they're associated with abdominal injury almost 50% of the time, especially to the pancreas, duodenum, and to the mesentery. This is an example of a chance fracture of T12. You can see that there is a horizontal lucency through the spinous process, the pedicles, and that it extends through the vertebral body horizontally to its anterior aspect. Fractures of the transverse processes are common and often overlooked. They are usually vertical in orientation or they may involve evulsion of the tip of the transverse process. Their importance is that the force that produces a fracture of the transverse process will oftentimes be sufficient to produce injury to visceral organs, especially kidneys.
The renal pedicle lies close to the L2 transverse processes, so if you see a fracture of the transverse processes of L2 especially, you should think of an associated renal injury. Fractures of the transverse processes are also associated with aortic injuries. This is an example of fractures of the right transverse processes of both L2 and L3. You can see a horizontal radiolucency in the transverse process of L2 and a vertical radiolucency in the transverse process of L3. And this CT scan shows you the proximity of the transverse processes, both the right and left transverse processes are fractured, to the kidney, which is labeled with a K. Spondylolysis is a defect in the pars interarticularis of the vertebral body. There is some controversy as to the exact cause of spondylolysis, but most believe that there may be some congenital component associated with repetitive microtrauma. It can be unilateral or bilateral, and when bilateral, it can be associated with a forward slippage of one vertebral body on another, usually L5 on S1, known as spondylolisthesis. Let's look at the normal anatomy of the vertebral body, especially as it relates to the pars interarticularis. This is the so-called Scotty dog, which I've drawn a collar on. And now let's carry that image over to a left posterior close-up view of the vertebral bodies. So this is the superior articular process. The nose is the transverse process. The foot is the inferior articular process, the eye is the pedicle, and the junction between the superior and inferior articular facets represents the pars interarticularis, where we'd be looking for a collar if there were a fracture. The lower circle demonstrates the normal pars interarticularis. This is an example of spondylolysis. You can see that the red arrow is pointing to a lucency through the neck of the Scotty dog, which is the pars interarticularis. When this occurs bilaterally, there can be forward slippage of one vertebral body on another. And in this example, we can see the lucency here oriented in the lateral view that represents the spondylolysis and the forward slippage of L5 on S1 or spondylolisthesis. To recap, we've looked at simple compression fractures, severe compression abnormalities, the chance fracture, axial loading fractures of T12 through L2, transverse process fractures, and traumatic spondylolysis. Here is your mini quiz. The question is what part of the thoracolumbar spine is most likely to be injured with this type of fracture? You can pause your computer or MP3 player while you think about it. And if you said T12, L1, or L2, you would be correct. In this individual who jumped from the top of a 12-foot ladder and landed on his feet, we can see that there is, in fact, a burst fracture of L1 in which the anterior aspect to which the white arrow is pointing is markedly diminished in height, and there is retropulsion of posterior fragments into the spinal canal.